Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja, Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In continuation with the previous session, today in Law of Contracts, in the second session, I will be touching upon a very important topic that is formation of an agreement. This slide here, which you can see on your screen, is highlighting the topics which we would be covering under this uh, session. Firstly, we will be starting with intention, the concept of intention to create legal relationship, moving on to offer and invitation to treat, that is basically discussing the difference between offer and invitation to offer. Thereafter, we will be proceeding to kinds of offer, then communication in case of proposal, acceptance as well as revocation. So, we will herein we will understand that how important is communication in case of offer, acceptance as well as revocation. Then we will proceed to modes of revocation of offer that is how can an offer be revoked which has been provided under the Indian Contract Act and thereafter we will be concluding with today's session the, uh, after having dealt with the topic of e-contracts. Friends to start with. Uh, this topic intention to create legal relationship, I would like to first mention that whenever we say intention to create legal relationship, what we mean is when the two parties are entering into any kind of contract, they had the intention or if I may say whenever the parties are entering into any agreement, the parties at the time of such entering into agreement had the intention to create legal relationship. When I say to create legal relationship, I mean that they had this thing in this in their minds loud and clear that if either of the party commits default in fulfilling the obligation or fulfilling any of the terms under the contract, the other party can approach the court to claim relief or to claim legal remedy as we had discussed in the previous session. Now, it is very interesting to note here that in the Indian Contract Act 1872, section 10 is there and section 10 is the most important provision when we are discussing the general principles of contract because first we need to understand as to what constitutes a contract. So, the elements or the essentials which have been highlighted under section 10 star, I will start with mentioning that there are three C's which have been mentioned under section 10. First C is the consent of the parties that the two parties are willfully, voluntarily and uh, with their free consent without any pressure or any force being exercised from anybody have entered into such an agreement. right? And as we had discussed in the previous session, the definition of contract is an agreement enforceable by law. That is why I am again and again mentioning the term agreement to tell you that if an agreement possesses all these elements, it becomes a contract. So, after the first C that is consent, the second C I would like to highlight here is the capacity of the parties. right? So, it is important that the two parties who wish to enter into any kind of contract, they are legally competent to do so. I am saying legally competent because the act itself highlights as to what do we mean by when we say parties are competent to enter into a contract. So, they must have attained the age of majority and secondly, they uh, must be of uh, legally sound mind and thirdly, not disqualified under any of the existing laws from entering into a valid contract. Now, the third C, third C as mentioned under section 10 is consideration which I had told you in the previous session also that consideration means something in return. If a person is promising to give you something or making an offer to give you something, you are returning 
that uh, uh, act of that person by giving something in return. So, if a person is offering to sell you his property, in return of that property, you are promising to give him the requisite money, the amount for the property. These are the three C's. Apart from the three C's which form the essentials of a valid contract, one also has to understand that there are two, three more essentials which have been expressly mentioned under section 10. So, we have lawful object, we have lawful consideration and it also says that such an agreement should not be declared to be void under the Indian Contract Act. There is a, sep there is a separate set of provisions which uh, deals with void agreements. We will be discussing that in our uh, later sessions. So, for the time being, you just need to understand that these are the few essentials as mentioned under section 10. Now, why did I tell you this thing at this juncture? The reason for that is that if we talk about intention part here, if we are talking about the intention part here, this intention, expressly this term intention has not been mentioned under section 10. So, section 10 is not saying that there has to be an intention to create legal relationship, but one has to understand that intention is very important. I just told you what we mean by intention to create legal relationship or intention uh, uh, to enter into legal consequences, right. Now, just keep this thing in mind, you can see on your screens that I have made this point here, I have highlighted this aspect here. General presumptions, what, why am I talking about general presumptions here? General presumptions, why? And then you can see a classification has been made. So, when we talk about social agreements or family arrangements or domestic uh, agreements or an agreement which you have made with your friend say that you promise your friend that see today for dinner, I mean tonight for dinner, I will be taking you out and the dinner is on me. And Consider a situation that due to X, Y, Z reason, you are not able to take your friend out for dinner as you had promised. Can that friend of yours sue you? The answer is no. Because the party is your never intended legal relationship or legal consequences. That is, if you commit a default in taking your friend out for dinner, your friend will uh, drag you to the court saying that ask this person to take me out for dinner or give, the, uh, give a particular uh, amount. Uh, of money because this person did not fulfill the promise. No, it is not like that, right. So, that is why I am saying here that general presumption is, the general presumption is that in case of social agreements or family arrangements, there the parties, both the parties have not intended legal consequences or legal relationship. So, this is a general presumption. The second general presumption as you can see here is that in case of commercial transactions or business agreements, there is a general presumptions that presumption that both the parties did intend legal consequences. That is when the parties were entering into a contract, they both bore this thing in the mind that if either of the party commits a default, the other one in exercise of his or her legal right will approach the court and claim legal relief or what we call as legal remedy. Now, is this general presumption enough? The answer is these presumptions are rebuttable in nature. That means, if say in case of a social agreement or a family arrangement, uh, the party, one of the parties is able to prove in the court that no the parties did intend legal consequences or they did intend legal relations. It can be decided otherwise also. When we say just if you can see on your screen, I am mentioning one word that is rebuttable. Under the evidence law, which is now known as uh, Bhartiya Saksha Adhiniyam 2023, earlier known as Indian Evidence Act 1872 the presumptions have been, uh, uh, the concept of presumptions have been highlighted and it is clear, uh, clearly stating that presumptions may be rebuttable in nature or irrebuttable in nature. When we say presumptions are rebuttable, we are saying that these presumptions, although there is a general presumption, 
general belief but they can be countered or they can be negatived in the court if there is requisite evidence in existence. When we say irrebuttable, we are trying to say that this presumption cannot be discarded, it cannot be contradicted, right. So, here when I am saying that the general presumption is that in case of social agreements or family arrangements, parties do not intend to create legal relationship. I am trying to tell you that presumption is rebuttable and can be proved otherwise. Similar in the case of commercial transactions or business agreements. Now, on this point, I would like to highlight uh, case law. So, you can see on your screens here that in the last point, on the last point, I have highlighted, I have mentioned two cases, Balfour versus Balfour, Merit versus Merit. Why these two cases are they similar? Why are the names of both the parties in these cases similar? Through these two cases, I am trying to highlight a point that both these cases involve husband and wife. Here, Balfour and Balfour are husband and wife, merit versus merit, both the merits are husband and wife. But in one of the cases, the court has held that there was a valid contract, parties did intend to create legal relationship or they intended legal consequences. Whereas in the other case, uh, the general presumption has been upheld that is in case of uh, domestic uh, agreements or domestic arrangements, parties do not intend legal consequences. So, in Balfour versus Balfour, the husband and wife, they had visited a uh, particular country, they had visited abroad in England, but the wife had fallen ill and husband had to join back his job, he had to go back to another country wherein he was uh, working. He had to leave. So, there was, a, there was an uh, uh, arrangement, if I may say, agreement between the husband and wife that till the time the wife gets fine, she gets healthy and is able to join back her husband at his place of work, uh, the husband will be providing her with some amount as maintenance uh, on monthly basis which will take care of her medical expenses and her uh, otherwise expenditure. Later on, so the husband went to his uh, workplace, he started sending uh, uh, the, he started sending the money on as decided, but there was some uh, the relations between them slightly turned sour and uh, the husband stopped providing that amount as had been agreed between them. So, the wife went to the court in order to claim relief. Now, in this case, before I tell you what the decision was, I would also like to at the same time highlight the facts of the other case. Then let us see what is the difference, then we will be able to better appreciate the difference between the two cases. Now, in merit versus merit, again involves husband and wife. So, there was a property which was in joint name of both husband and wife, they were half uh, owner of the half share in half shares in that property. Now, the husband was involved with another woman, uh, although he was married to Mrs. Merritt, but he was uh, the husband was uh, involved with another woman and he wanted to uh, leave the matrimonial house and go with that and uh, to, to basically join that woman. So, there was a mutual, there was an agreement between the two parties, wherein the husband had mentioned because I remember I said they were joint owners of a particular property. That property was mortgaged. So, there was an agreement between the two parties that if the wife is able to clear the remainder of the mortgage money, the debt, if she is able to clear that particular debt, she is able to repay it, husband promised that he would be transferring his half share in the property to the wife. Why if uh, the relations obviously were not cordial between them because he was involved with another woman. So, wife acted in an intelligent manner that she asked the husband to give it in written that he would be transferring her the half share if she is able to uh, repay the remaining uh, debt and sign the document. He did and in those circumstances, yes he did. Now, later when the wife was able to repay the loan, the husband refused or stepped back from his promise. He refused to pay re, to transfer his half share in the property to his wife. Now, wife also went to the court. 
in these two situations the wives had approached the court in balfa versus balfa when the agreement was entered into the husband the relations between husband and wife were very cordial and the court held that they did not intend any legal consequences it was it was a mutual domestic ag- arrangement made between the two uh, spouses and uh, by no means did they intend legal consequences but this uh, that is the general presumption was upheld but in case of merit versus merit different situation the relations between the husband and wife were not cordial and the wife knew she may be having an idea that husband may uh, refuse to fulfill his promise that is why she asked him to give it in written and put his signature on that document so that in case he commits a default later or he refuses to fulfill his promise the wife is able to take necessary action so here in the presumption the general presumption was rebutted because of the evidence which was in existence the next aspect which we have to deal with in our today's uh, session is as you can see on your screen the meaning of uh, the term offer and the essentials of a valid offer i have written here that to form an agreement first of all two elements are most essential offer and acceptance or because offer plus acceptance they lead to an agreement right section 2a of the indian contract act as we were discussing in the previous session defines the term proposal the act the indian contract act uses the term or makes use of the term proposal but proposal as well as offer they are synonyms they mean the same thing so if we go through the definition once which we had discussed briefly in the previous session it states when one person signifies to another his willingness to abstain from doing any to do or to abstain from doing anything with a view to obtaining the assent of that other to such act or abstinence he is said to make a proposal simple thing if you can see for yourself i have circled this uh, term here remember in the previous session i had just mentioned that how important is communication in case of both offer and acceptance the term signifies is mentioned in both the definitions section 2a and section 2b and signifies means to communicate which means when one person communicates to another his willingness to do that is to commit a positive act or to abstain from doing anything that is to omit to do something with a view to obtaining the assent of that other person that is with a view that that person will provide an acceptance to your offer and thereafter uh, an agreement will result in you can see now here on your screens that the person who is making the proposal is called the promiser or the offerer the person to whom the offer is made is promise promise c i have just corrected here on the screen you can see uh, is the promise c or offeree right promise c or offeree this definition has been provided under the definition clause or the interpretation clause of section 2 of the indian contract act coming to the essentials of a valid offer essentials of a valid offer not that every time i say i'll do this for you what will i get in return or i am offering to do this thing for you so every kind of offer which i am giving you does not mean is a valid offer and if you will give the acceptance contract will be formed to start with there must be two parties so if i am making an offer just you just saw in the previous slide it says when one person signifies to another that means we need to have two parties for to whom one who is making the offer the other one to whom that offer is made second is offer must be communicated to the offeree if until and unless i am communicating the offer to you how will i get the acceptance and the definition itself uh, of uh, the term proposal clearly states that when one person is signifying to another his willingness to do or to abstain from doing something why is he doing so 
in order to obtain the assent of that person to such act or abstinence that is in order to obtain the acceptance of that person right so that is that becomes all the more important until and unless i have communicated you to uh, to communicated to you the proposal or the offer you would not be able to communicate the acceptance to me once i have communicated the offer to you it is your duty now to communicate your acceptance to me that is to the offerer only now offer must be made with a view to obtaining assent of the offeree mere expression of willingness is not offer now consider a situation that you are having a discussion with uh, some person some acquaintance of yours saying that uh, i am i want to sell my property for uh, say 50 lakhs the other person says i accept your offer so when i am in when i am sharing this with you that i am willing to sell my property for 50 lakhs did i make an offer to you did i say i am willing to sell my property to you for 50 lakhs no so that's why it is it, it is all the more important that you understand that mere expression of willingness is not offer so you are informing the other person about your intention because you want to obtain the assent of that person the offeree i want to do this thing for you or i basically want to sell it to you i want to purchase it from you you will in return if you are ready to accept that offer you will give the you give your acceptance fine i'll give you this much for this property or uh, yes i accept your offer as it is right so that is important now uh, we just saw in the definition of uh, proposal that it says uh, the person may uh, propose to act to do something or to abstain from doing something right so that's why the the term here positive act if you are doing something that's a positive act if you are abstaining from doing something that is an omission or what we also call as a negative act right so uh there is also an important requirement that if you are making an offer to someone that offer has to be in clear words there should not be any ambiguity and the offer has to be certain offer has to be in clear and certain terms for example a agrees to sell to b in quotes my white horse for rupees 500 or rupees 1000 is this an offer if i am willing to sell my horse to you i'll say i wish to sell my horse to you for uh, this much amount why would i uh, say either this or that i am if i if i am doing this i'm giving choice to another person so then that person will give an offer to me this is not an offer because the the terms of the offer are not certain if i would have said my white horse for say rupees 500 that's an offer then it is on your uh, uh, on the other person uh, that is b to purchase that horse in 500 rupees from you or reject the offer which you have made now there is this important case uh, you can see on your screen lalman shukla versus gauri dat this is dealing with the one of the important rules one of the important aspects in case of uh, offer which is offer must be knowledge of the offeree see again here in we are talking about communication so what happened in lalman shukla versus gauri dat is that uh, nephew of a person went missing right so the person's nephew had gone missing and uh, what the first thing which people do is he had sent all his help uh, his people who were his employees people his servants and all to Uh, on a lookout for the missing uh, boy missing child while this particular person one of the uh, servants of his was away in order to uh, find the child this uh, the employer his employer his master he had advertised he had circulated pamphlets wherein he had announced a reward that is my nephew has been lost whosoever is able to find out the nephew will be rewarded with a particular sum of money right so now this uh, that servant of his he was able to locate the child and he got back the ch- uh, brought back the child after that he got a, he got to know about this uh, reward which had been announced now question arises 
can at such situation in in such a situation in such a circumstance can he claim that he has a right over that reward which was announced offer is you get the child you give the information regarding the child and you will be given this much amount as reward i get to know about that offer i am able to find out the child and i bring back the child i can claim the money why because in in the situation which i just told you the person is having the knowledge about that offer he knows about the offer when i don't know about the offer how can i claim acceptance because in lalman shukla versus gauri the the servant was already away on the lookout for the child he was already there looking for the child trying to find out the child it was only when he located the child brought him back that he got to know about the reward so he ca it cannot be said that there was any valid contract which had uh, uh, got into picture between both of them so it was not a valid contract because the offer had not been uh, the offer was not in the knowledge of the uh, person the next is offer may be express or implied this aspect i had told you in the previous session also that when we use the term express we are trying to say that uh, the offer has been made via words now words can mean written form also words can be spoken as well that is what we mean by express express is words implied means conduct that is you are conveying something through your conduct you are acting in a particular manner which is through which it can be implied that what do you mean exactly that is you are making an offer it has been provided under section 9 of the indian contract act two more important aspects are left to be discussed here so the next uh, one is the offerer must not thrust or you can say this also an offer must not thrust a burden of acceptance on the offeree now in felthaus versus bindle uh, the the situation was that uh, there was a nephew and uncle so the nephew had a particular horse so and uh, the uncle was interested in purchasing that horse from his nephew he gave him the he gave him a particular offer saying that uh, uh, i wish to purchase this horse from you in particular amount of money and if i do not receive any communication from you if i do not receive any communication from you any specific acceptance from you i shall consider this horse to be mine that means even if you do not reply i'll consider that you've accepted my offer that is what he wrote so either you write and say you have accepted the offer or you write and say that you are not interested in the offer now even if you are not interested in the offer and you decide not to reply according to this person it will still be uh, considered to be valid and contract will be entered into now i'll tell you what happened in this case the uncle had uh, written it that he would be considering that horse to be his if he does not get any intimation from the nephew the nephew committed one mistake that mistake was that this horse of his was to be auctioned uh, uh, along with other uh, uh, things it was to be auctioned but the nephew instead of communicating his intention or communicating his acceptance to his uncle who gave him the offer he communicated it to his auctioneer stating that uh, do not put this horse on auction or do not auction this horse because i'll be selling it to my uncle now i have communicated it to the auctioneer but did the auctioneer give me that offer offer was given my uncle and important requirement of uh, communication is that you are communicating the acceptance to that person who gave you the offer but here it is not happening that way he has communicated it to the auctioneer now auctioneer also ended up committing a mistake and he had put that horse on auction horse got auctioned and uh, the uncle filed a suit against the auctioneer right so but it was obviously held that there was no uh, title of the uncle over that property that is over the horse because there was no valid acceptance because the acceptance was not communicated and plus as has been written here that offer or offerer cannot thrust a burden of acceptance on the offeree 
if he has to accept the offer he'll inform if he does not want to accept the offer it is his right to either communicate the rejection or to keep quiet and do not act on it the last point as you can see on the screen is offer is different from mere invitation to offer or invitation to treat now we need to understand that uh, there is a difference between both these terms offer and invitation to treat invitation to treat is also referred to as invitation to offer it is a well established principle that the mere fact that a shopkeeper exposes goods which indicate to the public that he is willing to treat does not amount to an offer to sell we go to mcdonalds and we see that uh, when the where, where that person the the person who is on the cash counter where he is standing you can see that uh, there is a menu uh, card there is a menu on display above his head on the screen and the item name and the price for that item is is mentioned there is on display or is highlighted so what i am trying to say or what this concept tries to convey is such display mere display amounts to an invitation to offer now can we'll continue with the example of uh, mcdonald's only so fine you go there and you go to the person on cash counter you have seen the menu on the display and you have decided for yourself what do you wish to consume you place your order that i want uh, uh, these 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 things from your menu that is an offer which you are making to that person standing there you are not giving any acceptance to the existing offer because there is no offer in existence yet that display is invitation to offer that is the uh, the person who is interested is being invited to place an offer to give an offer to make an offer so person so now a party who is going there and uh, uh, placing the order is making an offer because see the situation may be that the person who is behind the cash counter may say that sorry ma'am sorry sir this particular item is not available right now right so that is if the item would be available he'll uh, take your order and he'll ask for the amount requisite amount if the item is not available he'll reject your offer right by communicating to you that uh, this item is not available right now fine so we need to understand that there is a difference between offer and invitation to offer i have uh, mentioned a judgment here pharmaceutical society of great britain versus boots cash chemist southern limited now this judgment made a very important point which you can see is uh, written in bold here that is in case of invitation to treat or invitation to offer the offer is an offer to buy not an offer to sell that is the mcdonald's person is not making an offer to sell but instead when you are placing your order standing there you are making an offer to buy that thing right so that is what invitation to offer is all about now in uh, and this point was uh, made in this very important landmark judgment on invitation to offer that is pharmaceutical society of great britain versus boots cash chemist limited so in boots cash uh, chemist limited the shop had put medicines uh, on display the certain type of drugs were kept in a particular uh, on a particular counter with the price written on it and this person this uh, party goes inside and he picks up a particular medicine goes to the cash counter and uh, it was an important requirement it's an english case so it was an important requirement when a particular description uh, drug is to be sold it has to be sold in the supervision of a trained or a qualified physician so keeping that in mind or obeying the law in that in the particular uh, shop boots cash chemist uh, southern limited in this particular shop general physician was sitting at the cash counter itself and was taking care and was checking the prescription before selling any such prescribed drug before selling any such category of drug which uh, was to be sold only on prescription right now the question there was a dispute and the question arose that the display the medicines which are on display with the price tags 
are it the, does that amount to an offer or is it an invitation to offer that is when the court gave the ratio or came up with this point that offer in case of invitation to offer is an offer to buy that is when you are picking up that medicine going to the cash counter and uh, placing the order that is an offer to buy now let's proceed it says uh, the se second point on your screen invitation to offer means intention of a person to invite others to make an offer and with a view to enter into an agreement an offer when accepted becomes an agreement whereas an invitation to offer cannot be accepted it is an offer which is an which is accepted it is not an invitation to offer which is accepted because between invitation to offer and acceptance there is one more step which is offer right so in case of harvey versus facey now the uh, situation was that this person owned a particular property uh, immovable property and uh, the other person the other party who was interested in purchasing that property wrote a telegram it's an old english case wrote a telegram to him a uh, telegram to that person saying that uh, uh, would you like to sell this property to me and uh, quote the lowest price in return of that in uh, in uh, revert of that particular telegram this person who was the owner of that property merely mentioned a merely quoted the lowest price did not convey his willingness to sell that property to that particular person or not but he communicated the lowest price this was the second telegram now in the third telegram the person who had uh, uh, written asking for the uh, asking for the quote the lowest price says i accept your offer i accept your offer but the other the owner said i never made any offer to you you had asked me about the lowest price i quoted the lowest price merely quoting of the lowest price friends does not amount to making an offer when you quote low up lowest price in case of commercial transactions business transactions also it clearly it only indicates that you are open to any kind of negotiation it does not mean that you are making an offer to the other person throwing light upon the kinds of offer now to start with i mean although we have already discussed uh, these two terms here express offer implied offer so i would like to move on to specific offer and general offer specific offer as the name itself suggests that when you make an offer to a specific defined identifiable individual specific person that's a specific offer but what do we mean by general offer then general offer is an offer which is made to public at large now you will think that a like a few minutes ago i was mentioning that uh, communication of offer has to be made to the offeree then the offeree will communicate the acceptance to the offerer now if i am making an offer to public at large with whom i am to whom i am making the actual offer with whom i'll be entering into contract indian contract act itself says that in case of general offers there is no need to uh, uh, i mean there there is no need for communication of acceptance particularly and even performance of conditions in case of general offers or the offers made to public at large amounts to a valid acceptance now what happened you may understand this concept better through this case law that is carlil versus uh, carbolic smokeball company now in this case uh, carbolic smokeball company had come up with a medicine it had manufactured a medicine known as carbolic smokeball company which was there to treat this uh, epidemic of influenza or other diseases which were associated with influenza related to influenza now in the advertisement which they had come up with the carbolic smokeball company had come up with whosoever consumed that particular smokeball as per the prescription would and uh, as the the, the uh, as per the frequency also which is stated in the medicine in on the cover of the medicine will never contract this disease of influenza or basically it was a prevention to that particular problem which was in existence epidemic now and 
this is not just the thing in that advertisement itself the company also highlighted that who if there is some if there would be some person who despite the fact has taken that particular medicine as per the prescription and as per the guidance will not contract influenza will not contract influenza right but if somebody on the other hand ends up contracting influenza despite having taken that medicine as per the prescription the company would be rewarding that person with a particular amount of money i won't say reward but compensating right a particular price price would be given to uh, uh, not z e price c e price a particular amount would be given to that person if uh, that person falls uh, ill and third thing which that advertisement highlighted was that in order to make their uh, advertisement Uh, uh, in order to authenticate their advertisement they had mentioned that in a particular bank named alliance bank they had deposited a lump sum of money which they would be using to give to pay those people who contract influenza despite having uh, taken that medicine right now this lady carlel she read that advertisement she took the medicine as prescribed still she contracted influenza she went to the company she claimed that amount now she is claiming that amount the company says nothing doing uh, we never intended to enter into legal uh, relationship and uh, we did not make any offer to mrs carlil and uh, we are not bound to pay anything to mrs carlil because there was no valid contract in existence but the court held that the company was bound to pay that particular sum of money to mrs carlil which they had promised they were bound to give that money to her why because firstly it was a general offer it was a general offer that is it was made to public at large but if anyone from the public at large comes forward and performs the conditions of that offer you will enter into a contract with you have entered into a contract with that person moment the person has performed the conditions of that offer so when carlil purchased that product consumed that product as per the prescription and she contracted influenza you are bound because contract has come into an existence contract had come into an existence and she still suffered from the uh, problem despite having taken medicine court held that the company was bound to give her that amount and that there was a valid contract and that even a general offer is a valid offer because even though it is made to public at large someone from the public will uh, act on it now just to add on to it if now mrs uh, apart from mrs carlil there is someone else also who consumes that uh, medicine and contracts influenza now can there be one, more than one contract in such a situation the answer is yes it was a general offer made to public at large till the time the company does not remove that advertisement does not remove that advertisement from public domain anyone who would after having consumed that uh, medicine contracts influenza company is liable to pay uh, that promised sum of money to that person now next is counter offer let me explain it to you through an example briefly now a makes an offer to b saying that uh, see uh, i am willing to sell my house to you for 1 uh, crore he makes an offer in return of it the other person the party b states that uh, i want to i i am ready to purchase your house but not in 1 crore but uh, say 80 lakhs right so is that by communicating this thing that yes i am ready to purchase your house but in 80 lakhs is this uh, an acceptance answer is no it's a counter offer he made an offer to you that he is willing to sell property in 1 crore you make uh, a counter offer to him that i am willing to purchase your property in 80 lakhs so when a counter offer is made the previous offer first offer which had been uh, given earlier 
it comes to an end it becomes void it is of it is non existent now now the other concept of cross offer cross offer occurs when two parties make similar proposals to each other with neither party aware of the other's offer in this case there is no acceptance because both sides are making proposals at the same time and neither has had the opportunity to accept or reject the other's offer now coming to concept of acceptance defined under section 2b when the person to whom the proposal is made signifies his assent to that is communicates his acceptance to the offerer the proposal is said to be accepted an acceptance must be in response to an offer it must be in the mode prescribed that is if the person who is making an offer to you specifically mentions that the acceptance has to be given in a particular form particular mode so it must be in the mode prescribed then it says it must be made by the person to whom the offer has been made that is communication of acceptance to the offerer it must be unqualified and unconditional that is you have to accept the offer as it is you cannot make changes in the offer and you have to accept the offer completely you can't say these terms are acceptable to me these are not acceptable to me now section 3 of the indian contract act talks about communication of uh, communication of uh, proposals acceptance and revocation it says uh, uh, the communication of proposals the acceptance of proposals and revocation of proposals and acceptances are deemed to be made by any act or omission of the party proposing accepting or revocation revoking by which he intends to communicate such proposal acceptance or revocation or which has the effect of communicating it it simply is telling you the if i may say the mode of communication the mode of communication section 3 deals with the mode of communication that is how would you communicate your uh, proposal how would you communicate your acceptance to that proposal how would you communicate your revocation to that proposal and acceptance right uh, it can be through any act or omission by which that person intends to communicate such proposal acceptance or revocation or which has the effect of communicating it that is expressly impliedly section 4 is one of the most uh, one of the lengthy provisions under this uh, under the general principles so it says when is the communication complete in the previous provision we just discussed that what are the modes of communication here we are discussing when is the communication complete so the communication of a there are three parts first part the second part and the third part first part here is dealing with communication of proposal when is it when is the communication of proposal complete the second part is dealing with when is the communication of an acceptance complete third is dealing with when is the communication of revocation complete here at this point i'll highlight on the first two parts first part says communication of a proposal or an offer is complete when it comes to the knowledge of the person to whom it is made we just saw in lalman shukla versus gauri that communication of an offer is complete when it comes to the knowledge of the other person right the second part deals with communication of an acceptance now here you have to understand that the second part is further divided into two parts communication of an acceptance is complete as against the proposer when it is put in a course of transmission to him so as to be out of the power of the acceptor i am trying to tell you here that for example there are two parties x and y because this act was made in a very uh, made in a period 1872 wherein uh, there were no electronic contracts right people used to communicate through letters so this part means that uh, say x makes an offer x is making an offer to y now y uh, communicates his acceptance to x it says the moment y has posted that letter that is it, he has put this letter in course of transmission 
so as to be out of the power of so so as to be out of the power of the acceptor right communication of acceptance is complete as against x right now between this time period wherein x is so x has made the offer to y and before y could communicate the acceptance to x x has the time to revoke his offer x i'll just summarize it what i'm trying to say i'm trying to say that x has made an offer to y and before y communicates his acceptance to x x has the right to revoke the offer which he has made right similarly the uh, second sub part of uh, the second part here is trying to tell you that communication of acceptance is complete as against y when it comes to the knowledge of x which means that when y has posted his acceptance before it comes to the knowledge of x before it comes to the knowledge of x y has the right to revoke his acceptance that is why communication of an acceptance is complete as against proposer at a different time and as against acceptor at a different time because revocation of proposal is also possible before acceptance is uh, put in course of transmission and revocation of acceptance is also possible before the acceptance reaches the offerer right now this case this judgment bhagwan das govardhan das kedia versus messrs girdhari lal parshottam das and company it's an important as you can see on the screen i have clearly highlighted that it is a landmark case on communication of acceptance in instantaneous modes of communication now the rule if i may take you to the previous slide here if you just see this this portion here the second part it is trying to tell you that communication of acceptance is complete as against proposer when it is put in course of transmission to him so here it was being referred to letter because i told you that it was a time when people only knew letters to be a uh, mode of communication or communication in person was the rule here came this case bhagwan das govardhan das kedia which was dealing with when is a communication of acceptance complete when the acceptance is communicated through some instantaneous or fast mode of communication faster mode of communication here in in bhagwan das kedia it was telephone so for the first time in bhagwan das kedia it was laid down that if a contract is made through telephone where is the communication of acceptance complete is it complete where the uh, where, where the acceptor is that is where the offer is heard and the acceptance is put in course of transmission or is it complete at the place where the offer was made from where the offer was made and now where the acceptance has been heard so in bhagwan das govardhan das kedia it was held that if we go by what the as it is the language of section 4 it will mean that the moment the person on the other side who want, who was uh, who communicated his acceptance moment he uh, communicated he spoke the words of uh, acceptance on phone the communication of acceptance was complete as against the proposer what if the proposer did not even hear what the acceptor had said right so court held that in case of instantaneous mode of communication the rule as as it is as laid down in section 4 uh, uh, cannot be uh, cannot be applied it, it cannot be applied because here in in this case in instantaneous modes of communication only till the time the offerer has heard has received the acceptance one cannot say that the acceptance is complete right so it is one of the important uh, judgments because first of its kind now coming to the concept of revocation revocation means to annul something previously done you made an offer you revoked that offer by saying i take back my offer 
you made an acceptance to someone's uh, offer and then you say then you uh, wish to revoke that acceptance you do not wish to continue with uh, any kind of relation between with, with that person when can revocation take place we just saw under section 4 that revocation can be of offer also revocation can be of acceptance as well section 6 section 6 of the indian contract act provides for mode of revocation of proposal number 1 the first mode the most common mode of revocation of a proposal or revocation of offer is by communication of notice of revocation by proposer to the other party that notice of revocation does not mean you are sending a legal notice it means that you are communicating to the other person you are bringing it to his uh, notice to br bringing it to his attention that see i do not wish to continue right i do not wish to uh, continue i would not be waiting for your acceptance i take back my offer second is lapse of time prescribed in such proposal for its acceptance that is you gave the offer you had uh, mentioned a particular time period that within this time period uh, within this time acceptance should be communicated the time has lapsed failure of acceptor to fulfill a condition precedent to acceptance so in the offer say it was mentioned that uh, along with communication of acceptance a token amount has to be paid honest money some token amount has to be paid so that was a condition precedent to acceptance if a person does not fulfill that condition precedent the fourth or the last uh, mode of revocation as mentioned is death or insanity of the proposer if the fact of his death or insanity comes to the knowledge of the acceptor before acceptance before the person could communicate his uh, acceptance he comes to know that person who gave me the offer is either dead now or has become insane that is is not of sound mind anymore then in that case the offer automatically by default stands revoked even if now after knowing that the person is either dead or has become insane you communicate your acceptance that acceptance is of no value i would like to conclude with this last slide here regarding e contracts so e contracts are defined as an agreement which is made electronically instead of physical meetings between the parties to the transaction through electronic mode via email etc now e contract forms a significant part of e commerce which we all know we uh, do our do so much of shopping on uh, through e commerce only these days same fundamental principles of indian contract act are applicable this last uh, last two points in an electronic contract the offer has been communicated once it has entered the computer of the offeree and acceptance is complete when it has entered the system of the offeror i would just make this last point and conclude my session it act that is information technology act 2000 is a very important legislation here because it gives legislative validity or recognition to the e contracts under section 10a and in order to make any valid contract uh, signatures from both the parties are needed and e it act makes a reference for that thing to digital signatures as well right and with and uh, there is this landmark judgment also you can uh, see on the screen and can go through with this i would like to end this uh, session of mine thank you very much